So hi everyone, my name is Irina Karasieva and I'm a trustee of Fast UK. I also have a daughter, Emily, who is three years old and she lives with Angelman syndrome. Um, tonight we have a joint event between Fast UK and Angelman UK. Um, this is our second in series. We had a um, previous one with Ellen Hub Davis from Aparito. You can watch a recording on our YouTube and then we also had a webinar um, early in the year um, about clinical trials basics with Jennifer Panagulius, which you can also have um, check out on our YouTube. Um, today we have a um, fantastic guest, Will Pender, the Senior Policy Manager at Duchenne UK. Um, when we were introduced to Duchenne UK, uh, we were just amazed how how many fantastic things that they have achieved. And although the Duchenne um, muscular dystrophy is very different from um, angioma, to angioma syndrome. Um, we learned that there are about 400 people um, living with um, a Duchenne muscular atrophy in the UK in clinical trials, and we just thought it was amazing. So we want to learn from um, organizations such as Duchenne UK, and hence we um, we invited Will to speak to to you guys today. So thank you for making time for that, and. And most of all, um, thank you to Will for joining us tonight. Um, Will has a wealth of experience in terms of working in Parliament and also in public affairs, as well as the charity sector and uh, pharmaceutical industry. Um, he joined Duchenne UK in May 2020 and um, been, has been pivotal in shaping the policy positions and enhancing the charity visibility. Um, so. To tonight, he will um, share a little like small insights in terms of the um, advocacy process and how we can um, explore it as a community and contribute to the process um, effectively. So um, over to you, Will. Um, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And um, maybe just before I kind of hand over um, in terms of the housekeeping, there will be about 25 minutes um, talking and then we'll have Q&As. Um, at the end, um, you can drop your questions in chat or um, you can ask directly at the um, after the presentation. Um, so thank you all again and um, over to you. Thank you very much and thank you for the um, introduction. Um, I will now um, start the presentation, so it should um, hopefully start in just a second. Um, We can see it well. So, lovely. lovely. Um, so, hello everyone. My name's Will Pender. As Arena um, uh, um, um, very kindly um, said, I'm the senior policy manager at Tushen UK. Um, um, so, yeah, my background. If I just quickly touch on my background, um, I um, have worked in the private sector. I've worked in Parliament for MP. And then, as you said, in May 2020, um, I also um, started to work for Duchenne UK. I started in a role that pre, uh, did exist at Duchenne UK. There was no one uh, working policy or advocacy before me. Um, and so it, it was really a role that I was tasked with um, making my own and finding my own way with. Um, so if I just go to the um, next slide. Um, so um, I will um, try and make this. Um, um, as short as possible. I, um, what I want to get to at the end is the Q&A and give you one opportunity to ask your own questions and to have a dialogue. Um, but I thought it'd be useful is if I um, talk a little bit about Duchenne muscular dystrophy, um, talk a little bit about Duchenne UK, um, talk about our journey and the journey of our co-founders. Um, I'll touch upon um, diagnosis, newborn screening and the importance of registries. And then at the end, I'll talk a little bit about the uh, pathway of going from the lab bench to um, going to the clinic with a treatment um, and really the UK's experience um, um, with all those elements. So very quickly, what is Duchenne muscular dystrophy? Um, the important thing to know is it's very different to Angelman syndrome. Um, it is a um, um, it's a, a genetic disease. Uh, it can be inherited, or it can be um, just completely random mutation. Anyone can get Duchenne muscular dystrophy in um, any population. Um, it's um, considered rare. There's about two and a half thousand patients in the UK. 
Um, importantly, there is no approved treatment um, for Duchenne muscular dystrophy in the UK. Um, there is first thing that treats the underlying cause of Duchenne muscular dystrophy, which is a essentially a fault in the gene, which um, stops the body from producing um, the dystrophin protein. And a um, dystrophin protein is um, necessary to build a muscle mass. So people who can't produce dystrophin slowly lose um, their, uh, the ability of their muscles over time. And for muscles such as the heart, that is critical and um, um, leads to death. Um, the median age of death, um, which we've done some research into, is now considered about 34 years old. Um, that is an astonishing improvement to what it was. When I joined in May 2020, they were still talking about age of death being in their mid 20s. Um, life expectancy in Duchenne has changed considerably over the last few years, primarily through um, physical interventions such as mechanical full time ventilation, uh, which is how patients with Duchenne muscular dystrophy um, end their lives. Um, and if I first go to the next slide, um, this presents the, um, uh, once again, it's not hugely important because it's a background on DMD. This is the natural history model of the general dystrophy that we um, um, had one of our initiatives create, Project Hercules. The important bit here is um, the transfer stage, stage three, which previously wasn't known um, to doctors or academics. And it, but it's a very important um, stage to patients. And um, people with DMD will spend about nine and a half years of their life in what we call the ambulatory phase, when they can walk, about one and a half years of their life in the transfer stage, when they can't walk long distances, but they can support themselves in and out of a wheelchair, which means they can do things like make themselves a cup of tea, go to the toilet um, unaided, really important quality of life things. And then they'll spend the remainder of their life in the non-ambulatory phase in a wheelchair, um, um, needing in increasing um, intervention um, as they age. So initially, um, a um, a ventilator during the day and then a ventilator during night, and then you'll get to the point where you can't feed yourself either. Um, it's very cruel, it's a very debilitating, um, progressive disease um, that becomes apparent about after four years of age. So also is it Shen UK? So I have on the right here our two co-founders. Um, these photos are taken uh, in the last few months. They both got honours in the last King's um, honours, uh, which we're very proud of, and they'll be mortified that I'm sharing the pictures of them uh, receiving their honours. Um, so um, Emily Rubin and Alex Johnson are two um, mothers to boys with Duchenne muscular dystrophy um, who met uh, crying in the toilet at a Duchenne conference. They comforted each other, um, st um, started the conversation and realised they both wanted to achieve the same things. Emily had formed a charity called the Duchenne Children's Trust. Alex had formed a charity called Joining Jack and decided to form, uh, uh, join forces and form um, Duchenne UK. Um, the DMD Hub, Project Hercules and DMD KUK are three of our um, initiatives. Um, I will touch upon some of those um, later, especially in the Hub. Um, and they are projects, um, problem solving projects run by Digital UK aimed at um, specific issues to get care for um, Emily and Alex's boys in their community. Um, we also um, sponsor projects, so things like the Cypher, which is around education, while DMD is primarily treated as a um, physical condition. Um, there are, are also cognitive, some cognitive elements that come with it, and um, the Cypher is run by um, parents of boys with DMD who have a specialisation in education, and they help um, um, with resources for families and schools and things like that. Um, we also have um, things like our annual Duchenne Dash, which is our big fundraiser we do every year. Um, we get a lot of um, volunteers to cycle from London to Paris um, um, every single year. <laughs> I think we're on a, oh gosh, we must be into the double digits by now. Um, they sleep on the ferry. Um, it's not something I've ever done. It's not something I'm not sure <laughs> Duchenne UK could pay me to do, but um, other people pay us to do it, which is amazing. And um, the, the life cycle of Shen UK has really started with, um, has really changed with the ability of Shen UK to operate. So at the start, um, and the Alex were grant givers. They went out, they raised money, they got a pot of cash, 
and then they looked around and they looked for opportunities um, to, um, to give money to, whether that be uh, promising treatments in trial, um, companies that are investigating DMV, things like that. The next stage up from that was Emily Alex became trial funders themselves. They, that was a promising drug that they wanted um, um, to see go to clinic, and so they um, co-sponsored um, a trial. Um, after that, when it looked like treatments were on the horizon, that there might be something coming down the pipeline, they turned into access campaigners. That's when I met them in, gosh, I think it would have been 2015 or so, uh, when I was still um, working in an agency in, um, for a private company. Um, we worked with them on a pro bono campaign um, to form the Early Access to Medicine Scheme. Um, and then um, since then, they've uh, gone what I have uh, in my, my buzzword way have described as a system changer, where they're looking at what's wrong systemically with the health system and the NHS, with um, anything that might be creating barriers um, to care and to treatment and addressing those. So I'm going to touch upon um, diagnosis newborn screening. Um, in the UK, there is the um, newborn screening committee, I believe it's called. Um, they are the people who look at whether or not um, a certain condition should be included in the heel prick test, the test that um, parrots and newborns are offered um, just after birth. Um, do, despite um, our request um, um, and our response to this consultation, they once again um, decided that um, DMD would not be included on this list. And I included here the screenshots of some of the reasons for why they didn't um, include um, DMD on that list. DMD is in a slightly odd space in that in the past, I think it was in 2018 in Wales, um, the Welsh NHS did screen for DMD. Um, and the response they got back from some people were very mixed. Some people were very thankful that they were able to get um, this diagnosis early before the um, symptoms presented. And they got um, and they found out from their GP around about the age of four. That's the simple age of diagnosis. Um, other people said, oh, I'd have much preferred to live in blissful ignorance for four years. Um, and you stole from me the chance to um, for me to be with a child and not be worrying the whole time. Um, you can see um, the things that mattered to the um, screening committee. Um, the first one there, as I said, is not a um, reliable test. I'm not sure that's strictly true, but they probably know more about it than I do. But you know, there was a test in the past, maybe it didn't reach um, um, enough of a uh, confidence criteria for them. Um, the very key one, a lack of evidence that screening would improve the long term health of babies. That basically means that there's um, no treatment for DMD. So if you're able to diagnose someone with DMD early, um, what's the point if there's not a medicine to give them to cure them? Um, and then the final one about where they mentioned reproductive choices, I mean that that's definitely not true um, because we know families where they have um, three boys or with genetic muscular dystrophy and if they'd known after their first one was born they might have changed their family planning. Um, so that's a, a very disappointing one. We'll be making our representations to new bond screening committee when it's uh, when DMD is reviewed again. Um, I did look to see if Angelman syndrome is on their radar. I could not see if they have uh, investigated Angelman syndrome in the past, and it might be something that you'd want to um, um, do in the future where you reach out to new bond screening committee and say, please consider um, adding our um, condition to your list. Um, the other thing, which is a new exciting thing that's going on, is Genomics England uh, started their generation study um, and they've got a newborn genomes program. Um, we have been in touch with them. They will not be including Duchenne muscular dystrophy on the list, essentially for the reasons that the newborn screening program um, won't. But they are um, doing, they are screening um, thousands of children um, for loads of conditions. Um, as a trial, essentially, and they are they've got a short list at the moment. I think the short list is quite long. I think it's in the hundreds um, that they're screening children for. And this is looking towards the future of the NHS and being able to move past the historic heel prick test to something more um, new and innovative. Um, once again, I looked up to see if I could see Angel and Syndrome on their list. It looks like it's not, but you might want to engage with Genomics in the future about um, whether they're considering adding it onto the list in the future. Um, patient registry. So I understand that there is a um, global Angelman syndrome registry, which is fantastic. Um, in DMD, um, there um, are some registries um, 
but we have found that um, we've not been able quite be able to use them for the purposes you want, and you've had the same from academics and clinicians. Um, we have, um, through one of the initiatives, the DMD Hub, which I'll um, explain a little bit more about in the next slide, um, have been creating our own reg registry. Um, not quite launched yet, um, but um, in, in its final form, but we have already been recruiting people onto it. Uh, it's been very promising so far. And we're hoping that this will um, create a step change in the ability um, for the UK to host clinical trials. And at the end of the day, that's one of the things that's very important to our community, getting access to the new um, and exciting treatments, even if that is um, during a clinical trial. So I um, mentioned the DMD hub. Um, on the right there is um, the organogram, as it were, of uh, the DMD hub, how the DMD hub operates. Um, the General Muscle Industry Hub was one of the very first projects that Emily and Alex um, came together on. Uh, it was to solve a very simple issue. Um, there were only two sites in the entire UK that were conducting clinical trials for the share muscle dystrophy. And the amount of boys who are going on to trials, and I should have mentioned that almost only affects both um, the share muscle dystrophy. Um, it was in the single digits. There was a minuscule number of boys who um, were on clinical trials, and the demand was gigantic. And so what um, Emmanuel did is they um, um, sought out some experts. They found um, the experts at the Neuromuscular Centre in Newcastle, the John Walter Muscular History Research Centre, and the um, other experts at University of Newcastle teamed up with them to create a central place that could um, offer some um, clinical trial capacity building, um, coordination um, and information sharing. Um, and they have gone from there only being two places in the UK that can do a trial for DMT to I think we might be up to 30 now, uh, it's definitely at least 12. Um, and going from single digits um, numbers of boys to far more. Now, I think we're up to something like 550 boys in total have been inducted into a well, um in the UK. Um, and bearing in mind our population is up to two and a half thousand, you're looking at almost 20% of our entire population um, is on a clinical trial. If you also factor in that uh, for clinical trials, they're usually interested in children, and that's um, some of those two and a half thousand people will be adults, um, you can see, you know, we have almost at capacity on the, our ability to recruit um, um, for, for clinical trials. Um, on the left, it's it's a very um, lay, simple summary of you know where does the medicines come from. It starts with you know discovery in the lab, goes to a clinical trial. Um, we don't get many phase zero trials in, in the general muscular dystrophy. Um, I've certainly not seen any phase four trials go through, but um, you'll see these terminologies. They use Roman numerals, um, and it's essentially the um, um, the uh, they narrow down on the medicine and um, with each stage, and it, um, the drug gets near its final form um, um, with each step. Um, by the time it gets to phase three, you're looking at uh, most likely a viable drug. Um, and in other disease area, once it gets to about phase three, that is when the um, regulators start getting interested in it and the possibility for this treatment to enter the NHS uh, comes about. Um, and so I'm going to um, um, finish off with just a little bit of description of um, what is that health journey. Once you um, have a treatment, you've it's gone through a clinical trial, it's looking promising, it's um, had some results, what happens next? So this is the general journey of um, in the UK, and I, and I can't emphasize enough, this is just the UK, um, of um, how a drug gets to patients. Um, something that is a real challenge is that it works entirely different in America, um, and that is that can um, oftentimes cause stress from people because there's that there are seven approved DMD treatments um, in the US. As I said, in in the UK, there are some going through appraisal at the moment. Um, there are none, um, and that is because their system works um, very differently. Um, and that essentially all they have is an MHRA that their FDA um, assesses. There's some um, efficacy um, but it's mostly looking at safety you know is this safe could this potentially treat the condition it's not a um, gigantic um, hurdle that you have to um, get across and then gets down to the insurance companies whether or not it's reimbursed of course in um, the UK we have NICE 
um, NICE is uh, specifically um, um, gives uh, specific recommendations for NHS England. However, all the other parts of the um, NHS system do pay attention um, to NICE. And it's a little bit of a system where NICE can't tell well Scotland or Northern Ireland wants to do. Um, those nations have their own separate assessor bodies, but the assessor bodies actually follow the exact recognitions of NICE. So usually a recognition from NICE um, uh, turns into um, a um, UK wide recommendation, but not necessarily as they all get a bit murky with evolution. Um, yeah, so as I said, in the UK, it starts with MHRA. The, um, the um, um, MHRA has had to really change in the last few years. Um, Previously, we were under the auspices of the European Medicines Agency, um, and the OHRA has essentially had to take on all those functions. Um, it's been a, sort of a learning curve for them. There's been some um, ups and downs with the MHRA, um, but I'll go into more detail about the MHRA NICE um, um, in a second. So, in fact, I'll go into the MHRA now. Um, so, the MHRA primarily concerns with safety, quality, and efficacy. What they're not looking at is cost effectiveness, which happens at the next stage. Um, they are, as Everyone is in the health space. They love acronyms. Um, they've got some of their acronyms on the screen there. Um, ILAP is a new one. It's the Innovative Licensing Access Pathway. Um, it's a way for um, promising treatments to uh, potentially get into the UK faster. Um, we were involved, uh, Emily, um, one of our co founders, she was on the steering committee for that one. That was being boosted. Um, there's also PINs and EAMs. These might be things you hear about. Um, it's a, um, well, let's see if I remember it now, um, Promising Innovative Medicine and uh, the Early Access Medicine Scheme. And a um, compound needs a PIMS designation to qualify for the EAMS route. And if you um, successfully go down the EAMS route through the MHRA, then you can bypass NICE, at least temporarily, until they conduct their appraisal. Um, and this uh, a potentially life-saving medicine can be made uh, accessible to the public. Um, and then finally, as IRP, I've included a screenshot of um, the, um, um, the relevant nations who IRP on the right. Um, that is um, the international recognition procedure. This is also a brand new thing, only started last month, um, this year. The um, MHRA has committed to fast-tracking any treatment that um, gets approved by any of the reference countries on the right, um, including the FDA, which is um, um, and the EMA, which is which is important, um, because they are seen as um, 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 a first market for treatments. A lot of treatments, um, the companies, um, when they're trying to assess where in the world they're going to launch first, US, Europe, often right at the top. Um, when I say fast, I think it's something like 60 to 90 days is, is what the, is the uh, time scale they set themselves, um, um, which would be amazing if they're able to achieve that. Um, in the DD space, we've not seen anything um, navigate IRP yet. I'm not sure how many treatments have because it's so new, but it's, it's something to be aware of. Um, so once something has been uh, deemed to be safe, it's then up to NICE to judge, is it cost effective? Uh, once again, we enter a dizzying world of um, acronyms, um, layers on top of health economics. I'm not a health economist. I, uh, however, as the senior policy manager at Gen UK, I do coordinate um, our responses to appraisals. We've had several appraisals of treatments while I'm at Gen UK. Um, this is the stage where, as um, um, a patient charity, you have the um, most opportunity to engage with the process. If I just go back um, to slides, um, the MHRA is um, independent. Um, Department of Health and Social Care politicians can't really interfere with it. However, when they are making their assessments, they usually don't include, there's usually not a um, um, long period of patient consultation um, because they're just looking at safety data. You don't need to talk to the patients about safety. NICE, once again, also independent, free from political control. Ministers really tell it what to do. Um, but at this point, they really do care about patients. Um, so I'll go back to the NICE slide. Um, we are on the 5th of March. There is a committee meeting happening um, for a treatment uh, in DMD that's going through this process. So we're right in the midst of it at the moment. Um, the way that NICE determines um, cost effectiveness 
is through a health technology assessment and HTA. And there's generally two types of HTA. Um, there are single technology assessments. There are also um, multiple technology assessments, but I'm not going to mention those, but it gets extremely complicated. Um, and then there's the highly spiced technology route. Um, STA is um, the, um, for lack of a better term, normal default route. Um, HST, there are four criteria to qualify for that now, um, that which has only changed last year or so, um, and it is designed primarily for rare diseases. The difference is, um, to put it very simply, um, the cost effectiveness doesn't have to be as good to pass an HST as it does for an S STA, and that's trying to take into account some of the uncertainties around rare diseases. Um, devastatingly, the criteria now almost always excludes um, conditions like degenerative muscle dystrophy because according to NICE we're not rare enough. At two and a half thousand people in the UK we um, are rooted consistently down the single technology assessment route um, which we are worried might be absolutely killer for us in that no treatment we're able to get through um, NICE with the type of cost effectiveness that they're seeking. A uh, cost effectiveness that is um, really intended for um, large stable adult populations you know things that affect everyone like um, or lots of people like diabetes or you know um, heart conditions and things like that um i've also mentioned on that um quality and ices the, the thing that um sadly you have to get your head around um for nice appraisals um, um this is how nice quantifies the quality of life that a treatment might offer. I mean, the diagram there is um, um, describes it. Um, they rate your quality of life from zero to one, um, and that um, what they do is they work out how many additional years this um, medicine might give you. Uh, they um, um, times the increased number uh, um, 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 quality of life that you might have, um, and then that gives you what they call. Um, a nice, which is um, how they put a monetary value on extended quality of life. Um, and so on that happy note, um, I'm going to finish with questions. <laughs> so I, I, I ended with the, with the joy of going through um, a nice appraisal. Um, we're just about at um, the halfway mark here. So if I stop the presentation, Rita, shall we see if anyone's got any questions for me? Anyone? I can see Vlad has a question, but anyone else? Yeah, I just wanted to say if uh, yeah. you could raise your hand so that we form an orderly queue, that would be awesome. And then, Irina, you might need to um, unblock the person's microphone. Yeah, I can do that. Yeah. Maybe to seed, since I raised the hand. Um, uh, Will, you, perfect presentation, really, really topical, and thank you for the overview. Um, you mentioned that you couldn't use the registries for the purposes you intended to use them. If you don't mind, could you expand on, on that topic and what, what was the issue and what would be your advice to charities such as ours? Or, uh, yeah, if you could, thank you. Uh, yeah, my, my understanding is, um, uh, to put it very simply, um, data governance. From what I understand is the way they structured uh, some of the registries in the past, it was very difficult for anyone new to come in and try and use the data for their clinical trial, for their study, um, to apply it to the um, to the model for their medicine. Um, and of course, if people can't access it, then it's, then it's of, of no use to them. Um, there was also an issue around how patients were um, um, you know, taking part in, in registries, um, their data was being collected at clinic, they were taking part in the surveys and all the metrics and, you know, how quickly can you stand up and all this sort of thing. Um, and then they weren't able to get to access to it themselves. And so then people were feeling um, a little bit like, why am I taking part in this? Why am I doing this every time I see my doctor when I can't even see my own progression and see how my scores are changing over time? Um, so so that there, were, there were several problems um, um, that needs to be addressed. And I think, yeah, but where we ended was probably our own. Really, you're muted. Thank you, Will. Thank you for that. Um, Ellen, um, would you like to ask your yes. question? 
Yeah, go on. Do you hear me? Yeah, yes. we can hear you. All right, all right, perfect. Yes, I actually have two questions. <laughs> um, one is uh, you mentioned that uh, during uh, NIS, during the um, to get access to the drug uh, as a patient organization, you have the, the most opportunity to engage um, with, uh, with the policymakers. And I was just wondering, uh, how did you engage uh, with NICE? And um, also, like, is there anything that you did in terms of um, um, burden of disease study or anything similar like that to support it? That's one question, and I will ask the other one later. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, thank you. Yes, uh, stagger them for me. Um, yes, um, so how do we engage with mice? What opportunities are there to engage with mice? Um, so we've been very lucky um, with mice. They have been um, very receptive to engaging with us. They um, formed a core um, part of Project Hercules, uh, which is one of the initiatives that I sort of breezed over at the start um, of my presentation. Um, Project Hercules was when we got to the point where treatments were um, coming on the pipeline, they've, they've navigated the MHRA, um, you know, it's one hurdle after the next, um, and we got to the final hurdles, nice, and things all started to fall down a bit. And so we got all the companies together in a room, we got most importantly nice with us in the room, we got together the um, um, health economic experts, the clinicians, the academics, um, and rather than the companies having to reinvent the wheel every time they went to uh, NICE, we made a single wheel, uh, for lack of, you know, st st please stick with my analogy, a single toolkit um, that they could, uh, everyone, all the companies that participated in Project Hercules could use um, to take with them to NICE. Um, that's all good that helps the companies um, but uh, another critical thing that project Hercules did is our community were being bombarded with survey after survey trying to record the experiences of um, them um, and their children um, and it was draining and it was difficult um, 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 to emotionally draining to relive um, the, your moments of grief, yeah, diagnosis and like that um, over and over again. Um, and so we asked all the questions once, record the questions, and then and then um, companies can use that. Um, the reason I bring all this up is because um, because NICE was such a key part of that. Um, they, as an institution, got quite educated as to, uh, um, as to um, what is important in DMD and um, uh, the challenges to DMD, and so, so knowledge in NICE is, is quite good now um, on, on the general school history off the back of um, Project Hercules. Um, now, of course, that doesn't mean you need to create a Project Hercules to engage with NICE or, 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 um, um, or to work with them. Um, they, when um, something comes to NICE and they start a health technology assessment, they go out and they contact who they think is relevant. They'll have a big, long mailing list. Um, they a bit of research, I assume they Google, um, um, they go to Google and try to buy patient organizations. And um, in your inbox, pops an email saying, um, here you go, an assessment starting, um, here's the forms you need to fill out, um, here's the um, first part of the consultation to take part in, um, please get going. And if you want to be a patient expert, um, here's the form um, to volunteer for that. Um, I don't know what um, treatments for Angel syndrome have already gone through NICE. I don't know if you've taken part of them in the past, um, but there will be a generic email somewhere on NICE's website to do with health technology assessments. Um, and it might be worth just popping them an email and saying, um, we're a charity of Angel and syndrome space, please email us to any ma mailing lists um, um, relevant to it. Um, so so there's no, that's a very long answer. And the short answer is they, they go out and they seek you. And they ask for your opinions okay. and if you're not hearing from them just uh, put your hand up to them yeah all right that's uh that's super interesting thank you and and, and, then and, next... and, and sorry Anna, ah, you, you, asked me about, you asked me about burden of illness didn't you um um so we've done a lot of work on on burden of illness um through project hercules um that only got published, I think, at the end of last year. So I don't think we've done a huge amount um, with okay. our study on Bosnia and Honest, but that is something that has, that has recently come out um, as Project Hercules. OK, good. And that is something that's being leveraged with uh, NICE, I assume, or that's the goal? Yeah, 
Yes, right, we're trying to. We also have our own qual. This is another extremely boring thing that I, did, that I didn't bring up before. But, but when NICE, um, uh, essentially NICE has, for lack of a better term, they have a set questionnaire that they apply to every disease area when um, assessing the efficacy of a drug. It's called the EQ5D. And we right. deemed that the EQ5D um, didn't work for our disease area. And so we made our own qual called the DMD okay. qual. Um, and we partnered with the University of Oxford Innovation Centre, I think it's called, and um, that they license it. And so I, it's free for charitable purposes. Companies have to pay to use it. Um, but it's, it's a bespoke quality of life metric for our disease area that we are really pushing companies and NICE to use at appraisals. And we're hoping this one that's happening on the 5th of March might actually use the quell that we've designed rather than the EQ5D. Yeah, I heard it's not uh, super well designed. The, not for uh, not for rare diseases. No, not for rare diseases. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Interesting. And then my uh, second question was on the newborn screening. Um, I'm just interested to learn how you go about requesting an addition to newborn screening. Is it just you send an email, <laughs> and do you have like a a, like a case file or something that you need to prepare to to ask it or you just ask it and there's no like uh business case behind it so to say well I, i'm not sure how you get onto the list in the first place because sean Dishon uk um dmd was already something that the newborn screening committee um was considering but they um um look at everything on a rolling basis so our last assessment started in October 2021, and I think we found out in 2022. And then I think in 2027 or 2026, they will come back, they will reconsider DMD, and they'll have a look again at the landscape and see what's changed, what new medicines are in the market, what new tests are available, and they and they make another choice. Um, um, and it becomes sort of a rotating thing. Um, how to get on that rotating list to start with, unfortunately, I'm not sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen, for the interesting questions um, and Will for, for the great answers. Um, any other questions from anyone in the audience? No, I had one, Will, um, with regards to the role that the community can play. So obviously, I think most of the things that you covered is something that you guys do as Dushan UK. And um, I guess there is an opportunity to participate in the meetings with um, with NICE and MHRA to some extent to share the kind of patient um, patient's views. But in terms of wider, if we would want our community to be more engaged and advocate for for, for our children in in some way, what is the from what you've seen? What is the best way for each of us to to get involved and support um, the advocacy? Um, yeah, so we um, um, we run um, uh, webinars, a bit like this one, where we will give an update on developments that are happening in the two space. Um, and as part of that, um, um, we will have some sort of engagement at the end of it. People will to, you know, just discuss the issue, share their views on it. Um, that's something we found that's, that's quite useful. Um, we also have um, built into the Gen UK into our governance. We have a patient advisory board um, where there are people who want to contribute um, and join it, and they get oversight or well, a bit of oversight over what the Gen UK does, what some of our priorities are. Of course, we have trustees and things like that as well. Um, um, but that's a way that we find that people who really want to be proactive in the community are able to take part. They can they can take part in the BAB um, 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 that way. Um, um, surveys. I mean, it's a, it's a boring one, but on, honestly, taking part in surveys when, when they when they come about is a really important way that the community can can play a role because um, it empowers us as as the charity to go to regulators and decision makers and say, you know, you know, present qualitative and quantitative data. Um, we have a. Um, we're always looking to sort of um, widen the opportunity for our community to um, take part in um, sort of steering to Shen UK um, and what our priorities are. Um, at the end of this month, or in a few days, we um, are having a conference 
Um, we've not really held a conference like this in the past. We've had patient information days. And that's really been sort of a one way street. That's us telling people stuff. Um, this new conference, New Horizons, we're calling it. Um, we want to turn to a bit more of a two way street. Um, and then um, the, the last thing I'll, I'll, I'll say is um, you know, I've mentioned these nice health technology assessments a lot. Um, they, the, the committees are usually very good in that they want to hear directly from people affected by the condition or as the carers, it's usually the parents or people who are affected um, by the condition. Um, and I would um, um, really recommend people volunteering for those opportunities um, when they arise. There's usually only three patient experts at, m at most, um, sometimes even only two um, that take part in appraisals. Um, sometimes they'd even ask them to be nominated by a charity, so um, people can't nominate themselves. Um, but I think it's a really good way for people to have their voice heard. Thank you. That's a lot for us to take away. <laughs> Quite a few actions <laughs> there. Um, thanks, Will. I'll just check um, if anyone else has um, any any other questions. All right. Um, I have maybe the one final one then, Will, um, to to finish us off in terms of the any advice that you can give us as a, as a community um, to um, as we navigate our way through the phase one and phase two cl clinical trials, um, any kind of piece of advice from the work that you have been doing that you think um, we can um, take forward as well? Yeah, the, the piece of advice I always give um, um, people is um, look for the hurdle that's next in front of you, that the pathway to accessing drugs, um, the, the pathway to improving um, life for our community and potentially even finding a cure one day for our community um, is a series of obstacles after you overcome and you um, look for what's next and then um, motivate your organization solving that and when it solves move on to the next obstacle and that is the um, um, that's really the method that the Shen UK has used when uh, there were no clinical trials were happening, we won the DMD hub and we made loads of clinical trials happened, ha happen. When um, clinical trials were happening and medicines were coming down the pipeline to NICE, um, but things were getting stuck there, we formed Project Hercules and to, to fix that blockage and try and help things um, navigate the extremely difficult NICE process. Once stuff started to come out the other side of NICE, um, um, and you're looking at um, the NHS and how um, clinicians are uh, administering treatments um, to the boys um, um, and essentially stands in care. That was when we formed DMD Care UK, which is um, one of our most recent projects um, that is directly ad addressing that. And at each stage, not only have we sort of just you know, looked at what's our current club score, addressed it um, and moved on, but we did it um, collaborative, collaboratively. We did it with every stakeholder in the space, including, for instance, with Project Hercules, the companies. And there's some charities out there that wouldn't want to work with the companies because they're the people that profit out of um, our misfortune. Um, but we try and take the most pragmatic view we can, and we'll work with anyone and everyone who is a relevant stakeholder and um, will get um, treatments for our community. So that's, that's what I'd say. Look at what's the next obstacle and address that. Fantastic. So I think Vlad raised the hand as well. Do you want to squeeze in a quick question and then we can yeah. close? Yeah, maybe, um, Will, you explained, but I, I missed it. Um, I think you mentioned that there are multiple approved treatments in America, but none here in the UK. What, what, what is your assessment? Because um, in our context, there are multiple clinical trials that are likely to first get the FDA approval, uh, but we it, it's a bit of a nightmare scenario where there are approved treatments elsewhere in the world and not in the UK, which I'm guessing is a situation that Duchenne UK is or Duchenne population in the UK is in right now. Uh, unless I misunderstood the scenario, maybe you could comment and expand on that. Yeah, well, unfortunately, we're in a we're in a very um, complicated, and dare I say, political um, situation with with treatments. Um, we have had treatments approved uh, in the past. Um, I believe tamoxifen, which was originally a breast cancer drug, 
and that was repurposed was available for a short time in the UK or, or for a time in the UK uh, that eventually got withdrawn um, on efficacy grounds while it was safe to take they didn't think it did anything um, there's a treatment um, called um, I forget which one's the brand name which is the generic name is Asimilarin slash Translana um, Technically, there's access to that in the UK, um, which we inherited pre-Brexit through the EMA. Um, but the EMA has to draw on their access to it because they say it's effective. The FDA never even approved that one. Um, and it's still technical books um, over here, but um, might be withdrawn at some point. Um, Yes, it's, it's a it's a very good question. It's 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 usually it's it's down to um, the FDA's priorities, which is to do for mostly with safety. Um, it's uh, it's also a mixture of how the FDA is a is a first destination market, so companies going there first. Um, what's what I trying to say? I'm trying to say that potentially the um, um, you know, standards of approval um, might be easier to overcome in the States. And in fact, there's a, there's a one treatment in the States, uh, which is very much the moment because the FDA has approved it. And then the FDA does include it. It might not be effective at all. Um, um, so the, 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 the real answer in the DMD space is that it's really hard to prove efficacy with the treatments that are out there at the moment. And while the FDA has said yes to several of them because um, they're safe and they most likely won't cause net harm. Um, it's much harder to get those approved in other jurisdictions where their priorities are different. Um, and they might be considering things um, um, a bit above and beyond the FDA. But it's a really complicated, I mean, you can see I've, I've struggled to explain it. It's a really complicated one to, to explain to, to patients who will look across the bond and see that there is um, something that's labeled a treatment for DMT that's available in the States, um, you know, if your insurance company will pay for it. Absolutely not available um, over here or Europe or anywhere else. Um, um, and, and why is that? And some, some of the reasons it's because things are unfair, some of it's because um, efficacy might not be right there at the moment. Um, yeah, there's lots of lots of complicated reasons, as I said at the start of it, some of them seem to be political as well. Thank you. Well, really fascinating. I suspect we'll hear more from you in the future. It's been such an ins insightful talk. Thank you. My pleasure. Yeah, thank you, Will, and thank you, everyone, for finding time as well. I know everyone is busy, so we appreciate your time. And um, thanks, Will. We hope to hear from you in the future. So um, thank you, and have a good evening. And good Cheers luck with all. the conference. Hope hope it goes well. Oh, yeah. thank you very much. <laughs> thank Cheers you. All. Goodbye, everyone. Bye-bye.